Sure, thanks, Aisha. Um, uh, so I gotta make sure I can share the screen, which I'm never that good at. Um, <laughs> Just give me a moment, uh, share screen, share. Okay, do you see it? Yeah. Okay, that worked, all right. And I'm just gonna go to full screen and hope that that's a full screen for you. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks Aisha for the introduction. It's great to be here at the conference and it's a great honor to be the opening speaker. As Aisha said, uh, she and I have collaborated a lot um, over the years and this year, two of her students from NUST have joined my group in Calgary. Uh, that's a great gift. So thanks for sending some of your best students over to Calgary. Um, and I hope that leads to the dawn of some more collaboration. Um, uh, also, uh, yeah, it's nice to be here at the conference virtually. I've been to Pakistan more times than I can count, which is some number greater than seven. That's the limit of how far I count. And uh, so it's kind of sad for me to do this remotely because every time I've come to Pakistan, I've greatly enjoyed the visit, the hospitality, the history, the scenery, the adventures. Um, so. Uh, I hope I can come again in person in the near future. And of course, I hope I can see you here in Canada. We got our first snow on the weekend, so uh, you're welcome to visit almost any time of the year and you can, <laughs> you can check out our uh, weather and et cetera. Okay, oh, it says participants can now see your screen. Wonder what happened. All right, but I'm guessing you can still see it. Um, okay, so this talk I'm gonna give uh, is, is really about, it's it's, Quantum information computation, which is the topic of the conference, but also I know in my many visits to Pakistan, one of the uh, great areas of research is good quantum optics. Um, and so I decided to give a talk, which is dealing with quantum optics problems that are needed, that need to be solved to enable uh, forms of quantum computing. And quantum computing is a big deal lately. Um, superconducting quantum computing, which also has quantum optics, I won't go into here. Photonic, which I won't go into here, but in this talk, I'm gonna focus on solving some problems for ions and neutral atoms. Uh, I'll deal with uh, our methods for quantum control. So I've been working on quantum control and machine learning aspects to try to deliver extremely high quality gates that the, the gates in quantum computers have to be really good. So I'll talk about our work in, in the past year on ions and neutral atom quantum computing. And this makes use of quantum control. Quantum control itself is a hot topic. Um, in Calgary, we have our own uh, way of doing this, which is giving us some very nice results. So I'm gonna tell you about our the work, kind of work we do. Um, this work is done with three of my PhD students, Shakib, so Syed Shakib Badai, also Archismita Dalal and Eduardo Paez. And as usual, uh, the three of them did all the work in the research, all the work in preparing the slides, and I'm just the pretty face that gets up and tells you what they did, but um, they, they deserve the credit. And, uh, um, and, but I work closely with them and I try to make sure everything we do is not wrong. Okay, uh, and then down below you can see publications. So these are publications that are directly relevant to this particular work. The first line you can see to FizRev Lab two physical review letter articles from 2013 and 2015. And then since then there's physical review applied, there's a new journal of physics paper and a physical review A paper last year. And then, um, so of course, we're at the University of Calgary, we get uh, money, can't do science without money. So money comes from NSERC, that's the Canadian National Agency for Funding Science and Engineering. MyTax, which funds um, training programs, students get placed with industry. Um, Queen Elizabeth Scholars Program for excellent students. We get direct money from the Alberta government, which has prioritized uh, quantum as one of the key priorities now in the province. CryptoWorks 21, which is a national network for developing uh, uh, not just quantum crypto, but other forms of crypto that are disruptive for the 21st century. And finally, Compute Canada, which is a national resource that enables us to use up lots of compute time to solve hard problems. Uh, so I'm gonna now give you the outline for the talk. So this is uh, just tells you what I'm gonna talk about. And Aisha, the talk's an hour, so I should cut out at about 45 minutes, right? Give time for questions, is that right? Can't 
can't find the mute button. <laughs> okay, uh, you can tell me whenever you find the mute button. Um, so you can just use the reaction things at the bottom too. Okay, I'm gonna go for 45 minutes and then uh, assume that's right unless I hear otherwise. Um, okay, so first of all, I'm gonna do what now is my patent beginning. Oh, did you say? Um, I said that yes, you, you can go up to 45 minutes. Sorry, okay. my mic was unmuted by the organizer, so I... You have to get the organizer to give yeah. you permission on you, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about acne. This acne, ANCI, is just what I call Ames Clamps Novelty Important. So I've worked out um, my presentations to what I think is an art form where I tell you everything you need to know in, in a slide or two, and then everything else is detailed. So I'll get to that first. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you about the acne, the Ames Clamps Novelty Importance, and then everything else I'll fill in. And then the introduction, I'm gonna just bring you up to date on quantum control for ions and then quantum control for neutral atoms. And this will just be background information. Then I'm gonna specify the approach we use. And first of all, I'll talk about the mathematical description, how we deal with quantum control problems in this case, and then the technique we use, which is based on a formal approach known as a feasibility problem in computer science. So we, we uh, follow a strict method for defining the problem very tightly, and that enables us easily to um, draw on good computational mathematical tools once we get that well-defined. And then I'll tell you about the results we have for ions and neutral atoms, and uh, then I'll tell you conclusions. And the talk is, the whole talk is nine slides. So um, I'm gonna spend about five minutes a slide, go through them very carefully. On the right above, you can see a picture of Calgary. Uh, this is not Photoshopped. We really have clear skies, drinkable, clean water. Um, and a nice city. So uh, I feel um, I like to show off the picture because it tells you that it's a nice place to be. And then I like social media. So you can see ways to catch, uh, catch up with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, WeChat, Line, um, my homepage and Orchid. And there's a lot more. I, I big fan of social media. Okay, so first of all, with this acne, it's aims and claims. So I'm going to spend some time talking about what we're doing. And I'll go through word by word to try to make sure it's clear what the objective is. I don't wanna rush it. I wanna be sure that these points are, are very clear. Um, okay, so the aim of all this work is to design feasible quantum gates for scalable quantum computing with atoms. And by atoms, I refer to both ions and cold neutral atoms. I'm gonna use the curly Q whenever I wanna abbreviate the word quantum. Um, and now let's, let's understand what this aim is. So when I say design feasible quantum gates, of course, there's single and two qubit gates. And a gate to me is feasible if its error rate um, meets the requirement of the fault tolerance quantum error correction theorem. So a gate that is, um, a gate that is uh, well, basically the, the fault tolerance quantum error correction theorem tells us that there's a uh, performance level, the gate cannot make more than some percentage of errors in order for it to be scalable by employing quantum error correction and fault tolerance. And uh, so the aim here is to make the gates and experiments work to the level that, uh, that it would be scalable. And that's what, scalable quantum computing just means that we can make the quantum computer larger and larger with essentially polynomial rather than exponential overhead to build it up. We're not there yet. The current state of quantum computing, so-called NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum, they aren't looking for error correction or fault tolerance at the moment. That's fine, but I'm looking over the horizon when these things are going to matter. Um, and uh, then the atoms is clear, ions and cold neutral atoms. What I will uh, point out though is throughout the talk, I will talk about the fidelity of the gates. So we'll use fidelity to Try to make things feasible, but fidelity is actually not a great proxy for scalability condition. So this is what we read about as, so we will read papers with experiments reporting fidelity, and it's fine. The fidelity gives us some idea of how well the experiment's performing, but I just put a caveat. I'll talk about fidelity, but I really should be talking about gate error rate, and they're not the same thing. And I have a paper a few years ago in New Journal of Physics, which deals entirely with how to infer uh, gate performance from fidelity. 
Okay, um, now uh, the new claims here uh, are, are very uh, short. I'm just trying to make it short what I'm gonna announce here that, are, that I think are important new results. Um, so first of all, the first one says iron trap model for designing. And then that stack of three horizontal lines is the Greek letter Xi. And so Xi is defined to be the identity cross identity plus X cross X. That's the gate that, um, so in, in 1995, Serac and Solar proposed iron trap quantum computing. Um, and the iron trap had to be really, really, really cold. Not, not didn't turn out to be so feasible. And so uh, sometime later, Sorensen and Molmer wrote papers, a couple of seminal papers on what they thought of as a warm ion trap. I'm not gonna go into the details of those aspects of it, but essentially um, they, they have a two qubit gate that um, is a superposition of, of uh, doing nothing to the two qubits and flipping both qubits. And so, and I'm not gonna worry about normalization. So I should normalize the gate um, but I always think that normalization is for beginners. Sorry if I'm offending anybody, but normalization is something I prefer to leave out and, and then just uh, make sure everything that's not normalized, you would normalize it to do it. So um, that's the idea there is an ion trap model for designing that gate. And you think that there are ion trap models and there are, but those, the ion trap models that you find in the literature, the ones that are in published papers don't include all the important effects that go on an experiment. So we've designed a model and that model allows us to um, construct quantum control procedures and also to test and validate what we do. And uh, it's really just based on a master equation that has all the relevant terms in it. Um, okay, so the ion trap model we have, we think is pretty realistic. Um, we are, collaborating um, on this with Norbert Linkus group at the University of Maryland uh, in College Park. And unfortunately, what we think is realistic and what they do don't exactly match yet. So we're still figuring out every detail and they're still fixing up the experiment. So we are, uh, we are working on getting it right with respect to experiment, but, um, but we think we understand what's going on. We think we have a good model and I'll tell you a bit about it. Now, that's the Eintracht model. The second thing is that um, using our quantum control methods, we're able to improve the best uh, gate. And when I say the best, it's the best two qubit gate that's developed numerically uh, using numerical methods. And, and there, there's a gate time. So a gate takes some time to, to uh, execute and it executes with some fidelity. And the fidelity is the calligraphic F one minus calligraphic F I call calligraphic I, and the calligraphic I is the infidelity. So one minus fidelity is infidelity. And, um, uh, and, and so the infidelity um, that we consider is what previous work, not our work, the previous work has shown. And that's that the infidelity is bounded by 0 0.006. So the fidelity would be 99.4%. So that would be called two nines of fidelity plus a little bit. Um, so using our approach, we're able to cut the gate time by a factor of two. So we can ensure that the infidelity is, is bounded by 99.4%. Uh, the fidelity is, is above 99.4% um, or the infidelity is less than 0.6% and have the gate time. And having the gate time, I don't know if you're impressed by a factor of two, but don't forget that the uh, decoherence loss processes are all exponential. So cutting a factor of two can be very useful if you're cutting factors of two in exponents. So um, we feel that's good. We don't yet have a way to cut significantly below that. And it might not turn out to be possible. There's a whole area of research on, um, on uh, shortcuts to adapticity and um, speed limits and quantum mechanics and so on. They're, they're not totally clear what fundamental limits there are, but there is a sense that there are limits and we're not sure what the limits are here, but we feel like we're running against limits. Um, and I mean, what I'd like to do later would be not just to cut it, but actually to somehow prove that we are hitting limits, but I don't know how to do it yet. Okay, the third bullet point is with respect to neutral atom. 
And so uh, neutral atom community, some use rubidium, some use cesium, others can be used. We decided to just focus on neutral cesium atoms uh, with, and uh, uh, we work out, we, we basically improved the two qubit control Z gate, control Z gate, where we cut the infidelity by a factor of six. And this is important. Um, I'll tell you more about it, but our collaborator on this was Mark Safman. There's also Betteroff in Russia. And Mark Safman is with Cold Quanta now. So he's University of Wisconsin Madison, and also with the company Cold Quanta. And that's the leading company in the world for um, neutral atom quantum computing. And the two qubit gate performance is, is a big problem, but it's temporarily a problem. It's one that people are rapidly working to solve. So our reduction of the infidelity for a two qubit cesium gate by factor of six um, catapults the work forward. Uh, I'll tell you more about it. Um, this was published last year in Physical Review A, um, and it's actually a fairly well-cited paper because it's, uh, I think it does matter. And I'll tell you about that. Okay, and now let's go to the next slide. And so I'm just gonna tell you what's novel about what we're doing. Um, so first of all, what we do that's different from almost everybody else is we use global optimization and um, others use greedy optimization methods. And the difference between greedy and global, um, greedy looks for the local minimum. Uh, you know, you're, you're trying to minimize something. And so greedy methods look for the local minimum and global looks for the global minimum. It, it, and so if you wind up with an optimization problem that has multiple minima, then um, then the global technique can help you to, I mean, it, it's the tool of choice to be able to find the real minimum, not just the local minimum. And most of the times people don't care. And there's even um, uh, mathematical results that say why global optimization is not so necessary. Um, for example, uh, not, not so mathematical, but there was a science paper from Herschel Rabbits's group back in uh, 2004 um, and that led to some mathematical work and it argued for greedy methods for local optimization. Um, but my counter argument is that for getting the exquisitely high fidelities or exquisitely low error rates, the kinds of arguments that say that we can get by with greedy, I don't think work uh, so well. And, um, and as ultimately it just comes out of constraint that if we want things to be really good, the number of constraints goes up. That makes the um, landscape that we're trying to, for which we're finding the minimum, uh, difficult. And so I have my reasons, um, but by using our global methods, we are getting some good results. So I think, um, I think, it, I think it is good to use global optimization. And the second one is robust optimization. And so one of the dangers can be, and this is when you do everything numerically um, and and don't interpret, then uh, it's easy to start finding solutions where a tiny change in a parameter makes it no longer a good solution. So we also incorporate into our studies what I call robust optimization. And that means that if we find the parameters where things are working well, um, we then test where we allow parameters to fluctuate to make sure it works. And that goes back, this, back a slide back to this, um, this uh, claim about the iron trap model because we have our model and uh, when we test and validate, we are allowing fluctuations of parameters. Um, okay, and the importance of our work. So first of all, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, that we need feasible atomic two qubit gates. That's required for scalable atomic quantum computing. So if we wanna use neutral atoms or ions for quantum computing, the two qubit gates have to be good. That's often a weak point in, uh, performance in these systems. Um, now I wanna be careful what I say about a weak point because the, the experiments to date are impressive how well they're doing. When I say weak, I don't mean to say the experiments aren't good. What I mean to say is that the experiments just aren't good enough yet for scalability. Um, so, uh, so what I'm working on here with my group is ways to make these gates reach the level required for scalable quantum computing. Um, Second, uh, our techniques, although I'm gonna to talk to you here about neutral atoms and ion traps, our techniques are applicable for other quantum computing implementations. I mentioned that, the, uh, that superconducting quantum computing is a winner. It, a lot of the superconducting quantum computing analysis 
uses similar quantum optics tools. Um, and, and now there's a few things that make it complicated. It's a solid state system at full temperature with all kinds of weird things going on. But some aspects of it are describable by the techniques here. Um, subtleties include that with the three-dimensional electromagnetic field is one dimensional and superconductors and so on. But bearing all that in mind, the techniques that I'm talking about here are applicable there. And some of the references I mentioned in the first slide are uh, for superconducting quantum computing. So in fact, we started with superconducting quantum computing and then I moved towards neutral atoms and ions using those techniques. So it's not that our techniques will have applications for say superconducting methods, but we started with superconducting and then we moved to neutral atoms and ions where we could see some wins. And then finally, um, the final importance point is that we, uh, we uncover pulse design principles for example, by doing spectral analysis at the time series that we come up with. So let me explain that, that we solve things numerically using high performance computing, but we don't rest at that point. So we never trust our theoretic results. We test the robustness and then we look at, we will do things like Fourier transform it and then study every piece of that Fourier analysis to make sure that the bumps and the features that we see in the spectrum we can identify with physical phenomena. And then that gives us the intuition. So when we deal with experimentalists, we don't have to have the perfect model. We get the intuition from our analysis and then we can talk on an intuitive level, what, what are the features and, and how much each uh, thing that we tweak matters. Okay, so that's the acne. It's the aim I've told you, the claims, novelty and importance, and now everything else is detailed. Okay, so, uh, in this slide, I'm gonna tell you about just the background on quantum control for ions. For this paper, I've got a reference below, Choi Dabnath Manning, Figet, Gong, Duan, and Monroe. Monroe is the last author. Um, you might've seen the news lately. So Monroe, he's now at uh, Duke University, but he and Jung Sang Kim at uh, Duke University co-founded the company IonQ, which is the world's leading ion trap quantum computing company, recently valued at $2 billion. So it's um, it's a big deal. Um, it's in the news a lot. Uh, and so I've given you the reference to the paper. Um, when you look up papers, every paper nowadays has a DOI, a digital object identifier. Um, DOI runs a hash service that gives a short DOI. So 10 slash CDB4 is a short version of the DOI. So if you go to doi.org for these references, you can just type them in and uh, type in the 10 slash, et cetera. You'll be able to find the reference. Let me just take a bit of time to explain the physics of what's going on. Um, and Aisha, maybe you can't speak, but you can see my mouse move, is that right? Yes, we do. Great, thank you. Oh, you can speak, that's wonderful. Okay, so let me explain how this works. Um, this technique is based on the sorensen molmer type scheme. Um, and uh, this picture we've drawn, I'll try to explain everything. So down at the bottom, that's a laser source. So that's our, our, our cartoon version of a laser. It sends out a beam, the beam bounces off a mirror, then it goes into a diffraction grating that spreads the beam, and then a lens that makes all these beams parallel. And the purpose of having a lot of parallel beams, well, they're not parallel, it's plane wave right now. This is so that uh, we can address any of the atoms in the crystal. In our models, we deal with seven ions. So I think it's two, four, we only showed five here, but. So the idea is that the, the beam is spread out and then parallelized so that it can uh, address all the ions. And then the AOM is an acousto-optic modulator that's there to deflect beams, to shut off beams. And this way we can get a beam shining on the one ion and another beam shining on another. So that's the control. That's not what we did. That's, the, that, that's what is experimentally possible. And so you can see a blue and a red. So it's a bichromatic beam on one ion, a bichromatic beam on the other. And then over here, we also have another beam that is kind of like a bath. It, it bathes all the ions. And um, these aren't the true wavelengths, but I'm just gonna talk about green as the uh, beam that bathes all the ions. And then red and blue are two different beams, uh, the two, two, two wavelengths for the beam. So, false color, but it's red, green, and blue are the three colors I'll talk about. And then they address two different ions. We want to execute a two-cubic gate. 
The ions live inside of an electrostatic field. Um, so these are electrodes that have, uh, uh, well, electrodes. And then these are called end caps. And the electric field there traps the ions. The ions form what's called a Wigner crystal. They form in a row. There's also two dimensional traps. I'm just drawing one dimension here. And um, uh, so they keep equal spacing by Coulomb repulsion and they're kept in place by electric fields that are created by these electrodes. And then up here, um, the ions fluoresce, that's how they're detected. And we can set it up so they only fluoresce if the qubit is in the logical one state and not in the logical zero state. And these fluorescent beams pass through a couple of lenses that are directed to a photomultiplier tube and the photomultiplier tube converts the photon detection into electric field. That goes through a, and a double line in, in my way of drawing is a classical information. So it just sends, this is basically an electric cable, sends it down to a processing unit. The processing unit has a policy that's programmed in that causes a feedback and the feedback loop then controls the acoustic optic, mo uh, acoustic optic modulator. So this is in engineering language, that's a closed loop control system. So that's the way the system works. And then in our model, we build all this kind of stuff in. So um, some we don't care like exactly the details here, but we build in a lot of this stuff into our model to make sure that we're able to represent what's going on well enough um, theoretically and in terms of computer programs. This diagram gives you an idea of what's going on so that the circle here is essentially meant to represent that we're gonna tell you what goes on with the ions. The blue line out is just telling you that we blow up that region in the circle. And over here, you can see six ions shown and the dots mean they're more in between. This is the red and blue beams that are focused into the ion and then back out. So the beams uh, can be directed essentially to one ion and not the rest. And um, here's another one. And so the idea is that the two qubit gate is executed essentially by causing a rocking motion. This the crystal of ions will rock all together. A photon hits the ion. When photons hit, if they're on resonance, they're detuned. Well, no, that's, that's a logical contradiction. They're detuned, and then that means that for a transition to take place, not only does the photon drive a transition, but it also creates a phonon of recoil. So by managing this, we're able to do recoils on this ion, recoils on this ion, and adjust it so that the phonon from this one is shared with that one. This is called a quantum bus in the language. And I won't go into it. This is all in Sorensen and Molmer's work, two papers from 1999 and 2000, I believe. Um, okay. And so uh, this diagram to the right is showing you how it works. Our models all deal with uh, uh, 171 ytterbium ion. And um, this is the same ion that's done by ion Q. Not every experimental group uses ytterbium, but ytterbium is the one, uh, it's currently the leading ion for quantum computing at the moment. So we focus on that one, could have done a different one. And now I'm gonna to explain to you the uh, levels of the, the electronic levels of the ion and where it fits into quantum computing. So the ytterbium ion uh, has a ground state 2s half, two, uh, I'm a little bit worried about the two. Okay, I'll just go with that, but I, I just I, I have to think of the two, but anyway, it, it's an S orbital here. Um, then what happens is we do some um, hyperfine splitting. And so the, the 2S half has a submanifold. There's the zero state, that's the logical zero state, which, so this element of the manifold or this level of the manifold is the logical zero. This line is the logical one um, over here. And then mu represents a detuning. And the detuning is what we control to make sure that transitions also come with recoil that knock the ions back and forth. Um, and uh, okay, so then what happens is there's a transition that's detuned by capital Delta from 2P half level. And so over here, you can see now what the green, red, and blue beams do. The green beam, which we bathe the ions in, is meant to drive the transition between logical zero and this virtual state that's detuned from the P half. The, um, oh no, two P half, it's correct. Two S half, two P half are correct. Sorry, I mixed up myself for a moment. Then the red beam um, drives a transition that is detuned um, by mu 
and this is called red detuned. It's a lower energy, so it's driven here. And then the blue beam uh, drives the logical one up here. So these three beams are used to be able to drive these transitions. Okay, um, actually, let me just go back for a moment. Okay, so this is, this is the single qubit and then we'll have two qubits. And essentially, the, I'll go back to the gate for a moment and tell you. So over here, that was identity cross identity plus X cross X. So in this setting, the identity cross identity, if we started with a qubit superposition of zero one, then after applying the beams, nothing changes. So the superposition of zero one doesn't change. If we um, do some clever things here, then what happens is zero flips to one and we have a second ion where zero flips to one and one flips to zero. So this is uh, this gate that we're trying to make is a superposition of doing nothing to the ion and flipping both ions. Okay, um, now I'm gonna to go to the model for the neutral atoms. And for this one, uh, I'm referring to here uh, a review paper by Sa uh -oh. uh, Safman, Walker, and Molmer that came out in 2010. I think it's Reviews of Modern Physics, and that's the short DOI to look it up. Um, in that case, we have neutral atoms, and the neutral atoms sit in a two dimensional optical lattice. So essentially, there's crisscrossing laser beams that create um, uh, potential wells that will trap atoms. And ideally we wanna get one atom per well. Often this is referred to as an egg carton uh, diagram. Um, but what we would like is the atoms in two dimensions and we'd be able to, we'd like to be able to just like we did here, make a two qubit gate between those two ions. We'd like to pick any two atoms and execute a two qubit gate between them. Um, so uh, what I'll talk about here is the, the experimental state of the art. So this is rubidium, I think it's rubidium 85. One D, one D array of 10 rubidium atoms back in 2019, again, the short DOI to look at the paper, achieved a gate time of 0.4 microseconds, that's 400 nanoseconds. And the, oh, that's um, incorrect. That infidelity should be less than or equal to 0.05. Sorry about that. That was left over from what was still in F. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna explain how that works. In this case, we have a diagram. So this is adapted from the paper last year in, in Physical Review A with Saf and Bedroff, and then my students, Dalal, Paez, and me. And um, in that case, um, here's the qubit at the 6s half. Um, and the letters are not right. Okay, yeah, this is still, we're still doing the slides up to today. So uh, I didn't get a chance to do the final check. Um, so this again has the hyperfine manifold. We have logical zero and one, logical zero and one. And then we wanna be able to um, execute a gate. And so in this case, uh, we're using a Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. That's how it works. In, whereas this was rubidium, we're dealing with cesium. The reason we're doing cesium is because that's the atom of choice with Sappin's group. Um, but the kind of results still would have, we could easily do it for rubidium as well. Um, okay, so here, this is the Rydberg level, and this P is an intermediate level, and the intermediate level is 7P half, and then the Rydberg level NS half, and in this case, N could be in the 60s, would be typical. Principal quantum number would be in the 60s. We um, have the beam that drives, okay, so I'm just going to tell you, in our paper, we do two cases. One would be a dipole transition, which pushes from the one state directly to the Rydberg level. This is a, but what I'm showing you here is a quadrupole transition. And so I'm only gonna focus on the quadrupole version of these gates. So it's a two photon process that excites the atom detuned somewhat from the Rydberg level. The capital omega's usual notation are Rabi frequencies. So it's a detuned transition uh, to P. The Rabi frequency is capital omega one of T, and then there's another one. So these would be bichromatic fields here, making that quadrupole. Uh, then capital omega two of T is the Rabi frequency for the second level. For those who don't remember, the Rabi frequency is, is equal to the dipole moment of the transition, dot product with the local electric field, and then divide by H bar, reduced by its constant. Um, you'll notice that there's a couple of things going on. One is um, these are time dependent. 
So the problem that we have is to design pulse sequences. I don't know if I put the time, I didn't put time dependence here. These are also time dependent. So our problem is always how to, de how to determine feasible uh, time dependent functions for these quantities. And uh, the second thing to note here is there's this B with a curved double arrowed line. And that B is the strength of the Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. So Rydberg, when you excite an atom to a Rydberg level, it's got a very large dipole moment. And this has a very large dipole moment. So these two atoms have a strong dipole-dipole interaction across the whole range of, um, of uh, the lattice. And so essentially what happens is when you pick a pair of atoms, you can then figure out how strong the dipole-dipole interaction, and that gets plugged into B, and that's incorporated into our Hamiltonian. And then over here, these gamma Rs and gamma Ps are spontaneous emission. Everything's detuned, so the spontaneous emission rate is small. Um, and spontaneous emission from Rydberg atoms, is, Rydberg levels is small anyway, but we take that into account. Uh, okay, good for that slide. Let me check the time. Yep, I'm doing okay. So now I'm gonna tell you about the mathematics of how we deal with the problem. So um, first of all, we take these controls and then in order to optimize, we do discrete optimization. So we're not able to optimize for the function. Instead, we replace time by a discrete parameter. You know, so essentially think of a clock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. So the TIs represent those moments. We can make them as fine or as coarse as we want. And then we replace the time dependent function omega by a vector, bold capital omega, which is just the string of Rabi frequencies for each time in the mesh. And we do the same for the delta, the detuning. So I'll just go back. Um, actually, let me, yeah. So we go back. You can see here we got omegas and deltas that we need to control. And here I didn't write it, but we also have omegas and deltas. So it, it's the same technique in both cases. So we have our um, time dependent Rabi frequency, our time dependent detuning. And then this bold alpha just res, uh, represents all the constant parameters. So they're fixed for any given atom or ion. If you change the atom or ion, the alphas change and the story can change. And then there's a semicolon to separate those functions from time as a parameter. And then we have a time dependent Hamiltonian, which of course, when we do it numerically, we treat it over the same mesh with the same TIs. And then after that, we start to articulate the non-unitary processes. So the time-dependent Hamiltonian uh, generates unitary evolution, um, but experiments are messy things. And so we figure out every single non-unitary process, such as spontaneous emission, power fluctuations, collisions. We determine whether we can treat them in a Markovian framework or we have to use a non-Markovian method. And we also intuitively attach timescales to it. So we know what matters by how much and then by knowing what these rates are, we're able to check our numerical results to make sure those are reflected properly. Um, in the case of both the ions and atoms, uh, we can trust that, um, that the system is Markovian. And so we're able to use the standard quantum master equation. Rho is the density matrix for the mixed state. Rho dot is its time derivative. And this L is um, Lindbladian uh, jump jump operators and decay operators and decoherence operators. So this is just the non-unitary part of the master equation. And then we integrate it. So we write down the master equation, we integrate it, and we come up with a solution. In this case, the solution at the gate time. So the, you know, as you know, we're trying to cut the gate time. So we can plug in a guess gate time. Um, and then we want to know what control and what detuning would work. And so um, essentially, we make it a search problem in the end. So we're saying, you, if you guess a control function represented by that vector, a detuning function represented by the vector, pick the alphas, which are based on the particular atom and the geometry of the experiment and all that, and you guess a gate time, you'll get the solution. And then when you get the solution, then you say, well, in a perfect world, I would want to get the state psi. And, um, and then we want to minimize the infidelity. So this is the idea. We want to minimize the infidelity and we want to use a gate time that is significantly shorter than what's used in practice. And so essentially what we're doing is search. We search over a high dimensional space. Um, so the vector capital omega, the vector, sorry, capital, the vector bold capital omega, the vector bold capital delta, 
um, are then multidimensional. Uh, multidimensional. So if, if we break omega into say nine steps and delta into 19, nine steps, nine and nine is 18, we have 18 dimensions to search here. And we'd also search over TG. And so we just do a search over a multidimensional space, figure out the infidelity in every case, and then do an intelligent search. In this case, we argue that we need global optimization to uh, try to find the minimum. So that's the nature of the problem. Um, now, I mentioned to you that we formulate it as a feasibility problem. So we take what I just said, and then we formulate it as a formal feasibility problem. I don't write it fully formally here. There is a, a template for doing so, but I just give you the flavor of it. So um, the feasibility problem for both the neutral atoms and the ions is given a pair of ground state atoms. So in this case, the ground state, you can think of as the zeros. So we judge the infidelity based on assuming it starts in zeros. By the way, this in the literature is known as the Bell state preparation fidelity. So it's not, you know, I mentioned to you that using fidelity as a surrogate for gate error rate has problems. Using the Bell state preparation fidelity as a surrogate for the gate fidelity also has problems, but um, we're just doing what everybody else does. Uh, we know how to fix it, but uh, you got to start with the common view. So. Uh, we have given the pair of ground state atoms, each driven by intensity and uh, detuning modulatable. So it's time dependent intensity, time dependent detuning over a gate time TG. Find a feasible pulse sequence constrained by maximum laser power, maximum ion, uh, maximum TG. So what goes on is we're saying, um, uh, let me just go back. It says find a feasible pulse sequence. So that would simply find the vector omega would tell us the pulse sequence. The vector delta is the pulse sequence. So we're searching over that multidimensional space and uh, find it. And then, but we bound the laser power, bound the infidelity, bound the maximum gate time. And then we do it in a way that it fits within the feasibility condition. So feasible pulse sequence is one that yields a um, infidelity that uh, is less than the maximum that we allow. And the way that we do it in contrast, the usual optimization problems where it searches for the best. In a feasibility problem, you just say, okay, I want the gate time to be half the other gate time. I want this, that. You kind of say what you want. Then when you find a solution and it works, then you start over again. You say, okay, now I want it to be even better. You start over. In optimization, you use the result to keep finding better and better results. Feasibility problems, you start from scratch. Every time you solve it, you start from scratch. It sounds kind of crazy. And, and so most people don't do it this way because you think, well, why would I throw away what I know? But we find from a lot of experience and also um, there was a paper we had in the journal of physics, I cited that uh, 2018, where we actually tested these methods and we found that what looks wasteful actually performs really well. So we're finding more and more that casting as feasibility problems uses a lot of computer resources, but we get better answers. Whereas optimization, we still get stuck in places. Um, so our methods for doing this, we discretize these time-dependent controls. That's where we took time-dependent functions to vectors. And um, we uh, either do it as um, histograms, bins, or for the atom case, we actually use piecewise smooth functions, error functions, or ERFs that are integrals of Gaussians. We use those to connect things together. Um, and then our tool of choice, uh, so I, my group has worked on this for over a decade, um, we've done things like particle swarm optimization, multi-start and other methods, but for the kinds of problems we keep running into, we love differential evolution. It's uh, when we started differential evolution was not standard software. Now it is, but we have our in-house codes that we use. So we use differential evolution and we use our in-house codes to do it. Not claiming our in-house codes are better than others, but we've got those well-developed. And then the picture at the bottom is essentially representing what differential evolution is. Um, it's, it's a uh, kind of a descendant of genetic algorithms, but it uses a collective approach. And so the idea is that we write the search vector as a chromosome is what it's called. So it's a long string of quantities. This would be the omegas, the deltas, and the TG. And we write different guesses. And so each of these monochromatic towers represents some guess. And then there's uh, hyperparameters like mu, where we just have a way of you know, taking two of them, doing arithmetic subtraction of elements, 
adding it to something else. And these parameters, the, the mu, the gamma, are hyperparameters related to explore, exploit trade-offs, which I won't go into here, but if anybody wants to get into global optimization, then explore, exploit is, is uh, kind of a universal feature of any of these kinds of algorithms. And, and they fit in here with the way that we uh, connect things. And so what happens is we create these hybrid chromosomes and then we weigh them up against what exists and decide what to keep and what to throw away. It's a, the code for this kind of thing is short, easy to write, and it um, performs really well for a certain range of um, dimensions of search space and a certain range of uh, um, dimensions of search space and constraints, number of constraints. And essentially the number of constraints and the dimension gives us some idea of how messy the landscape is, right? So, um, you know, how many bad minimum traps and so on there are. Just gives us a vague idea, not rigorous. Okay, so now I'm gonna start telling you the results. I'll just check the time again. And uh, yeah, so I got by my clock, nine minutes, so. <laughs> um, you have quite a lot, you have time to start it early, so you can go longer. That's good. I'm really slow at giving a talk, so. Uh, <laughs> You know, how many other people can only do nine slides in 45 minutes? So let's take the, let's go through the ions. And now I'm going to explain to you what's going on. So at the top, we're dealing with the uh, ytterbium ion trap. The ions are separated by five microns. Um, and our goal in doing this, so in, in the, the experts in the field, that's not us. We're trying to impress experts. Um, the, so actually this was Ken Brown, who's at Duke University. And Ken said, we showed him our results with two or three ions in trap. And he would politely yawned, it wasn't so impressed. He said, if you can show me that you can do any uh, two cubic gate in a seven ion trap, I'll be impressed. So we've been working for a couple of years to try to impress Ken Brown. And um, so in that case, we're just gonna show you two cases here. One is we wanna execute a two cubic gate between ion one and five that are far apart. And the other is execute um, a two cubic gate between two neighboring ions. And we expect and we'll see that the two cubic gate between the nearest neighbor pair is good and between one and five is hard. And as you get more and more ions, in my way of thinking that ions get floppier. So um, the more ions you have, the more degrees of freedom and you have more modes. Essentially think of it like a string from undergraduate physics and, and uh, just jiggling the string, you get more and more modes. So seven ions turns out to be challenging because there's a lot of degrees of freedom. Um, so we'll look at, we'll just take these two cases and I'm gonna show you what the previous best is and what, what we've got. So the upper left diagram is the case of two, three. Those are the nearest neighbors. The um, one on the right is one, five, the two further apart ions. For the one on the left for two, three, what you're seeing here is the Rabi, the, the designing the Rabi pulse. And we're doing it as steps, so it's discretized. So it should be a smooth function, but we're approximating it by a vector with a sequence of steps. And every time there's a step, that's another element. So you can then count the number of steps and figure out how big the vector is. And um, the solid line global optimization is our result. And the uh, dash line is the Lagrange multipliers, which is the theoretical best before our work. And so in this case, you can see the following. They look very similar, but the method that's used, the Lagrange multiplier method is greedy. And what you can see is that the dashed line is narrower than the solid line. And that's in time. So in frequency, Fourier transform would give us a broader bandwidth. Um, so it's broader in frequency. And broader in frequency can be a problem because it will excite different levels. So, uh, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll explain these two diagrams and then I'll go below. Below is how we evaluate them. Um, okay, but they look similar and we just find it narrows. Where we find a much more dramatic result is, um, oh, and actually I wanna uh, talk about the symmetry. Let me just check that. Yeah, there, it doesn't look symmetric at the bottom, but they're symmetric. And so um, in our case, we don't require time symmetric. And I'll just mention to you that it, it's interesting in the literature, in a lot of cases where pulse designs are done, it's assumed that the pulse design is um, uh, 
time reverse symmetric. And this bugs me because I don't know why. It certainly looks beautiful and it makes the search easier. Um, and I won't tell you the answer. I'm going to leave it as homework. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you that um, if you take a function and you impose time reversal symmetry, what does that do to the Fourier transform? And so, you know, uh, and so um, it, what, what I find, I find that I understand the physics by doing the Fourier transform and look at the spectra. So if I say it's time symmetric, what would I do to the Fourier spectrum? And so that's homework for you to think about. Probably some of you figured it already when I said it, but probably most haven't. Okay, now in the 1.5 case, you can see that the black solid line is the global optimization result that we get, and the Lagrange multiplier is different. And when you look at this carefully, you can see that um, the, roughly speaking, the dashed line has a first peak around 26 microseconds, say. A second peak uh, in the 70 microseconds, around 70 microseconds, third one around 130 microseconds. Um, our result, you know, if you give me some leeway, it looks kind of modulated. So we're seeing this modulation on it. And then there's some other modulations in the modulations. And so what's going on is our global optimization is discovering that by a slightly different modulation of the pulse sequence, we can get much better results, which I'm gonna to explain to you. So the, um, uh, yeah, okay. So, and what goes on when you modulate, maybe I'll leave that as homework too, you know, that if you do the Fourier transform of the three peak sequence, and then, uh, and then if you modulate those, uh, what, what does uh, a modulation on the curve do in the Fourier transform? Um, physically, what's happening is by doing the modulation, we're taking into account uh, line shifts, resonances. So actually, I'll, I'll kind of give you half the answer here, that, um, uh, that the time reversal symmetry makes sense if we ignore certain things like an Ottler town shift. Um, Ottler town shift is often called AC Stark shift, but I'm teaching myself not to say that because it was... Otler and Towns who discovered it, and they just, they called it AC Stark, but it's really Otler and Towns that discovered it. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's the top bit. Okay, let's go to the bottom, let's evaluate. So down below, uh, what I'm presenting to you on the lower left is, um, is the infidelity, which should be as low as possible. Um, and there's four cases here. So the blue matches here. The blue is the two, three case um, of the Lagrange, mul Lagrange multiplier method, the previous best. And then the orange one with the cross is uh, one five. And the global optimization is, um, this is our result for two, three and one five. So what we should do is compare two, three to two, three and one five to one five. So let's look at the two, three. And we set about, in this case, we restricted omega max equals 200 kilohertz. This matches the conditions in Linka's lab. Uh, other labs can do 300 kilohertz, and it doesn't matter. We can basically, the experimentalist will tell us what's the biggest Rabi frequency they can reach, the peak Rabi frequency. Um, so the, um, what you can see here, this is the gate time on the abscissa. That's the horizontal axis. So on the abscissa, the gate time here for the blue only goes down to about 100 microseconds. Uh, but our case is the orange diamond. We're able to get infidelity slightly bigger, but half the gate time. That's what I said is the claim in the beginning. So our result will find sequences that will execute the gate in half the time, um, whereas the previous method can't get that far. Just can't find it. Now, when I say can't find it, I should tell you that greedy methods can always work if you get lucky, so if you know the answer, you know, if, if I go to the people and say, this is our answer, I say, okay, I'll plug it in my method and we find it too. But the, the fair game is they don't know, you know, if you don't know the answer yet, it's just infeasible to find it. And then if we look at the two, at the one five case, which is much more complicated, you can see here that the, uh, for, for the two faraway ions, um, you're over 140 microseconds for the gates. And ours is the level here. So it gets to half the gate time. So, and that's actually a better infidelity. So it turns out that for nearest neighbor ones, we can cut the gate time 
we boost the infidelity slightly, but not much. And for the far away ones, we're able to um, make it faster and reduce the infidelity. So we've tested this over and over. We've sanity checked with collaborators or uh, colleagues who tell us. And uh, so it seems like we do have a good method. We're able to design these pulse sequences better. And then on the right, um, I mentioned to you, this is for 200 kilohertz. Different experimentalists will be able to achieve different peak Rabi frequencies or max Rabi frequencies. And so in this case, what we do is look at the gate time and we look at what's achievable as we boost the maximum Rabi frequency. So now in this case, if we remove that omega max is 200 kilohertz, but we keep rising it to 300 kilohertz, which is true in other labs, um, then they can also achieve a shorter gate time. So when I say we have the gate time, they can also have the gate time by boosting the Rabi frequency. But if, you, if you're fair, you say, okay, um, how do we compare what's achieved? You can see here that we, um, when they boost the Rabi frequency close to 300 kilohertz, we're able also to get the same gate time at just 200 kilohertz. And the problem is with things like 300 kilohertz, again, is these alter count shifts. So uh, things are shifted. So let's do a like to like comparison. The blue is the Lagrange multiplier for two, three. The global optimization is the diamond. And you can see, so the greedy method here has that curve. And when you look at our method with the diamond, you can see that this is um, below this one uh, with a very short gate time. This one we match. So once you get past that point, our method produces better results. And then for the one five, which is the more complicated case, you can see it, that the pre-existing method doesn't work very well. It doesn't get below about 110 microseconds, um, whereas ours does here, slightly less, but the infidel, uh, sorry, the, the maximum Rabi frequency needed is much smaller. And again, keeping the Rabi frequency down is important because you don't want these line shifts. And the line shifts, um, and, I, and my intuition tells me that the reason we're able to do it is because um, not just the optimization, but also restrictions on sy symmetry. Okay. Um, so in this case, we did a further analysis and this is the robustness test. So mu was the detuning of the ion. And then this delta mu says, let's solve it and then allow, uh, let's allow for error bars on the detuning. And you can see, uh, this is the two, three case. This is the one, five case. So in the two, three case, you can see in the vicinity of delta mu that the Lagrange multiplier method and our global optimization deliver approximately the same results. Ours is slightly better than the previous best um, in the positive, when the detuning is off by a positive amount. Ours is almost the same, but slightly, oh, hang on. Ours is better on the left. Theirs is better on the right, yeah. So, but these are, um, there's a slight discrepancy but it's not actually, the, the difference is small enough that it's not important. But um, for the two, three case, uh, I would say that we can't claim better robustness. They're, they're approximately the same. But in the one, five case, you can see a big difference. One, five case, you can see that um, our results are very flat around zero. That means that fluctuations in the detuning won't matter a lot. Uh, whereas in the, uh, Lagrange multiplier method, it's quite sensitive. So fluctuations in the detuning are going to lead to big changes in the infidelity, relatively big changes. So again, our techniques are approximately the same for near, nearest neighbor, but quite good for further apart. Very two to three minutes, right? We have some questions as well. Okay, good. All right, go jump slot. Um, so then uh, this is the neutral atom case. This is out of the paper we have with Safin and Betteroff in FizRev A, um, where we, this is the picture you saw before for the two neutral atoms interacting. Um, in this case, we impose time, uh, time reversal symmetry on the pulses. Um, we did it there, that's normal, but uh, we're gonna do another analysis without time reversal symmetry. And then you can see the red, the blue, and the green pulses, how they are. And uh, so our pulse designs incorporate a modulation. And then what we do in these pictures is we show that this is the robustness. If delta fluctuates and I1 is essentially related to omega one, 
So if there's a fluctuation in the Rabi frequency and a fluctuation delta, you can see that the, the fidelity is very high in that region. So we get, it's very robust that, you know, in a reasonable fluctuation range, um, there's no change. And the same here, if we compare instead the second Rabi frequency, we get robust. And final slide. So the conclusion, which I won't drag out, is three points. So first of all, um, we're using evolutionary algorithms that differential evolution, and we're finding that they yield feasible control sequences. So our numerics is giving us very good results that we test, and we're also interpreting it. The second thing is that the, um, uh, to just reinforce that the two qubit gate for the ion trap is twice as fast. For the neutral atom case, we're not bragging about the time, but we are reducing the infidelity by a factor of six. And finally, I just mention again that the techniques we're doing aren't just restricted to atomic systems. They uh, should be applicable to superconducting as well. Thanks for listening. And thank you very much, Barry, for such a nice talk. You learned some, all the new things like on global optimization. So um, I would go to the questions. So uh, people have asked uh, some of them. So I think that we go to them first. So uh, the first question is that how much difference in effort there is in finding global minimum and a greedy minimum for optimization? Well, um, technically the problem is NP hard. So finding a minimum is, uh, you could think of it like being exponentially difficult. And so it's, it's, you know, it's a hard problem and uh, there's no easy solutions. Um, but the way the greedy method works, um, it just finds the local minimum. So it's not infeasible. It's very fast. And in tests that we did years ago in my group, probably eight years ago, we picked problems that were, um, reasonable for superconducting qubit systems. And we found that, uh, we could do the greedy approach 10,000 times faster, but we got worse answers. So the generally what you'll find is if you do greedy methods, they're very fast, um, much, much faster. And if they work, keep them. That's why almost everybody in the world does that. Um, the global optimization uh, takes a long time. It takes high performance computing and uh, it, you know, it's expensive to do. And, but you do it because if your greedy answers aren't good enough, you got to switch to global, but it's, it's uh, computing intensive. Right. Okay, um, and then another question is that what are the advantages of fine trap based computing over superconducting computers? Um, well, superconducting computing, okay, so the, I can tell you the advantage for me. The advantage for me is I'm a quantum optics guy originally. And so when I study ions and atoms, I know what's going on. I think I get, you know, I, I, usually I can understand all the relevant physics. Superconducting systems are solid state and they always have things going on that you guess at. Um, so one advantage of doing ions and neutral atoms is, at least from my perspective, the physics is a lot easier. Um, the second thing is, um, it's just, it's different noise processes, like superconducting qubits, you'll get charged noise on it. You get these weird two level system defects that are material based. You have to understand what the material is doing. Um, the ions, you have to worry about charge distributions and the neutral atoms, you have to worry about this optical lattice created by lasers with laser fluctuations. So I, I don't know what to tell you. Everything is physically different. That's why um, investors are picking all of, you know, you can see ion trap, neutral atom, photonic, um, and superconducting quantum computing companies. And there's variations even within those. And that's because everything has its advantages and disadvantages and nobody knows what's going to be better. You have to try them all. Um, okay, and uh, then there is a comment that, uh, do you think that two qubit gates can be performed with a similar error rate between any two qubits in the lattice and that's a benefit in on its own? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's a good question that, um, that, that as I'm showing you here with the iron trap, the uh, one five case is much worse than the two three. So, um, and that's why I think Ken Brown challenged us saying, you know, show me for two qubit gates for seven ions in a trap. And so they're different. And then, you know, uh, unless you see some structure in how you're going to do your quantum algorithm, um, you have to take the worst case. So, you, you know, in a sense, you have to study them all, find the worst one, and then the worst one is the error rate that you plug in to check scalability. Right. And then um, how error rate is minimized in ion trap quantum computer? Well, how is it minimized? Um, yeah. 
so uh, that, okay. So as I said, um, we're talking about infidelity here. So um, the error rate is often reported in terms of fidelity. Uh, and I explained that that's not a great way to report it. And I mentioned that I got a paper, um, Sanders, Wallman, Sanders, in the journal of physics about seven years ago. Um, so that paper we investigated carefully showing that, um, trying to, you know, to show what the relationship is. And then here it's Bell State Preparation Fidelity. So the first problem is that the way that we report error, we report performance in terms of fidelity is not obviously uh, connected. It doesn't obviously give you what the correct error rate is. So the current state of affairs is that people just study fidelity and hope that that, hope if there's enough nines of fidelity will give an answer. But um, really in order to study scalability, we really need to be, you know, understanding the gate error rate and then it's even more complicated because the proof of the, the fault tolerance quantum error correction threshold theorem is what's called an existential, not a constructive proof. So the existential proof says there exists some error rate uh, and if we can beat it, it'll be scalable, but the proof doesn't tell us what the error rate would be. So uh, it's a very complicated story that um, I don't have time to go into. Completely. Okay. Then how about a uh, two atom trap and how, what will the effect of neighbors on uh, double interaction in many atom levels? Okay, um, so, uh, well, okay. So going back to the ion trap, one of the problems is that floppiness. You know, the more ions you put in, the floppier your line gets. And so you have to, you have to be very careful about counting for all the emotional modes. And then I mentioned in the uh, trap lattice, there could be motion but often there are problems just out of laser fluctuations. So if you go back to this picture here, um, you know, that's the egg carton idea where you have an atom in each well, but if the crisscrossing lasers that form that egg carton have power fluctuations, then not only are the wells different depths, but they're also shaking a bit and the shaking can give energy to the atoms. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, that if you really wanna explore what the big, challenges are, those are the kinds of things you have to study. Okay, and um, uh, how about QDIPs? Do they fit into this picture? You have um, mentioned them in one of your reviews. Yeah, yeah I love QDIPs. Um, so yeah, the idea is that, like I said here in this picture right in front of you, it's got zero and one is the qubit. But look, there are other levels. So it's a four level system. Um, mm -hmm. So there are two ways that QDIPs fit in. First of all, um, Qubits obviously fit in here because even if you start in the zeros and ones, you're using multiple levels. So every step in between is a Q quart transformation. So we have to, you know, so qubits, um, unless you're guaranteed a two level system, like you believe that an electron is spin up or down, but in superconducting qubits, atom trap, everything, there's many levels that come into play. So you have to worry about the qubit transformations. And the reason I work a lot on qubits, one reason, is because I think those intermediate steps need to be benchmarked. And the benchmarking, benchmarking qubit gates is not trivial. Benchmarking qubit gates is highly non-trivial. And by, when I say it's non-trivial, I mean, we physicists don't know it. And when I say highly non-trivial, I mean that there are even questions mathematicians don't know the answer to. So if it, if it confounds both physicists and mathematicians, it's highly non-trivial. The second thing is, um, the way I think is that uh, if you're given say a three level system, why only work with two levels? If nature gives you three levels, use three levels. Use everything you've got. And so to me, the qubit mathematics is a lot easier, but, um, but you know, we're just throwing away Hilbert space to make our life easier. And it shouldn't work that way. We should make nature's life easier and we work hard on the math. So two things about qubit, qubits. Right, and there has been realistic quantum computing uh... Uh, done nowadays with qubits or not? Well, that's interesting. Um, so uh, it's only in the past, it was only in 2020. So uh, I, I did some work myself that was theory. We did uh, qubit benchmarking. We explored the qubit case carefully. And then there was Irfan Siddiqui's group at UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And soon after, he didn't cite my work. He didn't know about it. So, you know, and I, I, I think that, you know, it's just so soon after they probably didn't, Dig through the literature again, it's fine. But in Siddiqui's experiment, they benchmark Qtrits in a superconducting system. 
And then very fast, um, uh, Adrian Lepascu's group of superconducting qubits at the University of Waterloo quickly got out their benchmarking qubit. So there has been qubit work before, but um, it was 2020 where we really saw what I think is, you know, the first efforts towards really processing and scaling up qubits. Earlier work is often done with photons. Um, and uh, in the photonic case, they have very high qubits. Uh, you've got Lu Chaoyang coming to talk, you know, he's been involved in stuff like that. Um, it's great work, but in terms of the processing, I think Siddiqui's work is really, last year is really the uh, first step towards seeing qubit information processing. Okay, so, um, and one pet question, which everybody wants to know, when yeah. can we see such gate and devices outside lab? Um, well, I don't know what the lab is. Like to me, the whole universe is a lab. So uh, I, I think what the question must be, what everybody wants to know is when is it gonna stop being a physics experiment and it can be used? And the answer is it already is. Um, IBM's quantum computer. Uh, so right now you can use IBM's quantum computer. You can use um, D-Wave's quantum annealer. You can access Xanadu's photonic quantum computer. And so, you know, if you go in and look at it, they're kind of lab-like, right? The superconducting quantum computers live in big refrigerators, look like sterile cylinders. Um, Xanadu stuff all lives in a, in a big optics lab with detectors that are put at cold temperature. So, and th but those experiments, those, those quantum computers are on the cloud. So to me, it's left the lab in the sense that we can now interface. So you can sit at home, you can use their quantum computer, type into your own keyboard, watch on your own monitor the result, and somehow what you type goes into their lab and controls it. So uh, what does it mean to get out of the lab? What it means is that, you know, if it's on the cloud, it's out of the lab. That's how I see it. Okay. And so thank you very much, Mary, for your time, for coming here and um, giving us such a wonderful, wonderful talk. It's, um, we hope to see you again and we hope to see you around in the conference as well. I hope maybe in some discussion session or something. It's midnight, so I'll you know, have to balance <laughs> with my sleep schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much. We, uh, apart from this time zone difference, you, you still came up, so it's, it's a big favor to this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, everybody, thank you for sitting in this session and uh, we'll join again at 11.30 uh, in, the, um, in the first tutorial on quantum information, right? So see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, everybody else.